For those who say these policies aren't for me, what do you say to them? Well, if you are hardworking, if you have the dreams and the ambitions and the aspirations of... You're tuned in to Kaz TV. Before we dive in, if you find any value in this page whatsoever, make sure to share, like, and subscribe. That's an easy way to support what we're doing so we can continue to get the message out there and continue creating content that you like. Trump recently called out Kamala for this campaign strategy. And this strategy seems to be working. She's more popular now than ever, but hardly anyone notices she's using this strategy. Trump calls her out in this video, you might have missed it, but this could be the key on whether she wins or loses this election. Let's take a look. We all saw what happened and we see what happened. Kamala was a total disaster yesterday and at every other interview, she's been just a free fall. I don't know what the hell's going on. She can't do an interview. She doesn't want to do them. Something's wrong. Let's just take a look. Let me just see. We have a little video. You know, we spend all the money on these screens. We want to use them a little bit. Let's play it just for a second. Thank you. It is your story and the story of our friends before you is really, that's the American story, right? In telling your story and being so strong in the way you do it. And both of these stories, for you to tell these stories, this story is a story that is um, sadly not the only story. <laughs> and being a bitch. <laughs> That's not what you want. That's not what you want. Madam Vice President, you just laid out your economic vision for the future. Yeah. But still, there are lots of Americans who don't see themselves in your plans. For those who say these policies aren't for me, what do you say to them? Well, if you are hardworking, if you have... A, the dreams and the ambitions and the aspirations of what I believe you do, um, you're in my plan. You know, I, I have to tell you, I really love and am so um, energized by what I know to be the spirit and character of the American people. We have ambition. We have aspirations. We have dreams. We can see what's possible. We have an incredible work ethic. But not everyone has the access to the opportunities that allow them to achieve those things. But we don't lack for those things. But not everyone, you know, gets handed stuff on a silver platter. And so my vision for the economy, I call it an opportunity economy, is about making sure that all Americans, wherever they start, wherever they are, have the ability to actually achieve those, those dreams and those ambitions, which include for middle class families, just being able to, to know that their hard work allows them to get ahead, right? I, I think we can't and we shouldn't aspire to have a, an economy that just allows people to get by. People want to do more than just get by. They want to get ahead. Um, and I come from the middle class. Look, my mother raised my sister and me. She worked hard. She saved up. By the time I was a teenager, she was able to buy our first home. And, you know, home ownership for too many people in our country now is elusive. You know, gone is the day of everyone thinking they could actually live the American dream. So part of my vision for the economy is let's deal with some of the everyday challenges that people face and address them with common sense solutions, such as affordable housing. If you notice, she steers away from the actual answers to the questions and always seems to go towards a story. It almost makes it feel like she's trying to get us to forget about the answer and more about how we feel about a certain situation. <laughs> what would be your specific steps to strengthening the border? So it's a wonderful and important question. Um, I, you know my background was as a prosecutor and I was also the elected attorney general for two terms of a border state. So this is not a theoretical um, issue for me. This is something I've actually worked on. Okay. 
I have prosecuted transnational criminal organizations for the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. I take very seriously the importance of having a secure border and ensuring the safety of the American people. Uh, sadly, where we are now can be traced most recently back to the fact that when the United States Congress, members of the Congress, including some of the most conservative Republicans, came up with a border security bill. And here's what that border security bill would have done. It would have put 1,500 more border agents at the border. And let me tell you, those border agents are working around the clock. It would have just been about giving them some support and relief, which is probably why the border agents actually endorsed the bill. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl. And I'm looking at people from all over the country here, so I don't need to tell the folks who are watching this what fentanyl has done to families, to, to kids in our country, and the need to take seriously stemming the flow coming into our country and addressing that extraordinary and, and tragic issue in terms of its effect. The bill would have allowed us to have more resources to prosecute transnational criminal organizations. Mm. And it would have been part of the solution. And Donald Trump called up those folks and said, don't put that bill on the floor for a vote. He blocked the bill, and you know why? Because he'd prefer to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And this strategy is incredibly effective, especially because people are naturally inclined to listen to stories. Research shows that people are 22 times more likely to remember a fact if it's wrapped in a story. And that's one of the main reasons why her support keeps growing. The narrative sticks, even if her answers really don't. But it's not just in politics. This technique has been used to shape our society as a whole. For example, look at the rise at transgender identification. Just 15 years ago, if you were to ask somebody, do you believe someone could be born in the wrong body? They would have looked at you like you were crazy. But today, it's not only accepted, but celebrated. And finally, new rule, if something about the human race is changing at a previously unprecedented rate, we have to at least discuss it. Broken down over time, the LGBT population of America seems to be roughly doubling every generation. According to a recent Gallup poll, less than 1% of Americans born before 1946, that's Joe Biden's generation, identify that way. 2.6% of boomers do, 4.2% of Gen X, 10.5% of millennials, and 20.8% of Gen Z. Which means if we follow this trajectory, we will all be gay in 2054. Why is that? Storytelling. 15 years ago, less than 1% of the population identified as transgender. But today, one out of every 20 young Americans you see will identify as transgender. So what's driving this change? Stories, Hollywood, media, movies, they're all telling stories and it's pushing a certain agenda that's clearly having an impact on our society, whether good or bad, depending on where you fall in this perspective, in this argument. Think about how the media portrays the transgender movement. It's all about struggle, portraying these individuals as heroes fighting against oppression. It's a dream she's had for as long as she can remember. What happens in the good fairy dream? So when I was two years old, I went up to my mom and asked her, when is the good fairy gonna come with her magic wand and change my penis into a vagina? You were two. Yeah. For the now 18-year-old Jazz Jennings, that dream is about to become a reality. This is something I've always known that I wanted. Yeah. Yeah, it's right up here, Jazz. Jazz is arguably the most famous transgender teen in the country, carrying the torch on behalf of trans kids' rights for the last decade. Her work recognized from GLAAD to the human rights campaign. The hatred, cruelty, bullying, rejection, and discrimination must stop. Known for her relentless advocacy from gender neutral bathrooms to integrating school sports, she's tackled some of the most divisive issues head on. Now, just to be clear, we're not talking about the individuals that fall in this category. We're talking about the ideology that the society and storytellers are pushing. So nothing in this should be taken as we don't like these people that are struggling with this issue. The main message should be 
why is this message being pushed in a certain way? But when these emotional narratives dominate, where's the room for logical discussion? There almost is none because it's entirely based on emotion. And this is where storytelling can become dangerous. When emotions drive decisions in a democracy, it means the facts often get sidelined and that's a huge problem. People are moved by stories. Now, stories aren't always a bad thing. Even in the Bible, writers of certain books use stories, historical stories, and sometimes parables to meet the people where they were and move them in the direction God was trying to move them. It was a way to pass down laws, morals, and history. Think about Moses taking the Israelites out of Egypt by God's hand into the desert and into the promised land. It wasn't just about sharing a story or even just sharing history. Certain facts were shared and certain facts weren't because it was about reinforcing their identity and their faith in God. And these stories were told and told over and over again to keep the community logically and emotionally attached to their faith. So the real issue isn't storytelling in and of itself is wrong or bad. It's the imbalance. We need storytelling that combines emotion, but also logic. If we leave the storytelling to those who only push one side of the narrative and create non-logical ideas, we risk losing a balanced perspective. Here's the other thing. Don't just consume stories, create stories. Share narratives that inspire, educate, and bring people back to common sense. Because if we don't take control of the narrative, someone else will. And we've seen where that leads.